Good afternoon. Uh, Chantona Chaudhary, lead counsel for the commission. Our witness this afternoon is Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Can I ask that the witness be sworn or affirmed? Do we speak sworn or affirmed for the record? Sworn, please. Today's the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. So Prime Minister, we'll start with the uh, typical routine housekeeping. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can I ask you to pull, pull up WIT 66, please? Prime Minister, you will recall being interviewed by Commission Council on February 27th, 2024? Yes. Can you confirm that you've re reviewed the summary of that interview, that the summary is accurate, and that you adopt it as part of your evidence before the Commission? I can. Thank you. Uh, the next is WIT 67, please, Mr. Clerk. So, Mr. Prime Minister, this is the uh, summary of your in-camera examination. You'll recall having been examined in camera by Commission Council earlier this year? Yes, I do. Okay, and once again, can you confirm that you've reviewed the summary, that the summary is accurate, and that you adopt it as part of your evidence for the Commission? I can. Perfect. We can take that down now, Mr. Clerk. So I'm going to ask you to start today, Prime Minister, by asking a pretty general question, but nevertheless a fundamental one, which is, having been Prime Minister now since 2015, can you paint for the Commission a picture of the foreign interference landscape uh, over your tenure as Prime Minister? And, I, and before you answer, I'll just put two sort of precisions on that. One is that we know foreign interference comes in all shapes and sizes, but the kind of foreign interference that interests us most today at this commission is obviously foreign interference us as an institution. Second, um, all questions I pose to you, please stick to information. Um. that we had grown concerned about uh, as a party when we were in opposition before the 2015 election was the lack of oversight by parliamentarians uh, into what was going on in our national security universe in this country. Um, example of the... Uh, wasn't a process whereby parliamentarians of different parties of opposition parties could examine uh, top secret material uh, was seen as a lacking that Canada had, certainly compared to our other Five Eyes partners, which is why in our 2015 campaign platform, we committed to creating uh, a National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, whereby parliamentarians of all different parties uh, would be sworn into the highest levels of uh, clearance to be able to oversee, verify, uh, and um, ascertain that everything that our national security agencies were doing was on the one hand compliant with Canadian values, rules, and the Charter, and on the other hand, doing everything necessary to keep Canadians safe. So we started in 2015 with a commitment to strengthen our national security institutions. We did that by the creation of uh, National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. We also combined a number of um, oversight organizations into NCIRA, which is a more um, judicial uh, or uh, academic or high level uh, oversight of our national security agencies, uh, as well as you know, as we began to govern, strengthened our uh, various national security and intelligence agencies uh, and changed our national security advisor to a national security and intelligence advisor because it's not just about security and obviously the work around intelligence was getting more and more complex and important and part of keeping Canadians safe. Over the course of that first mandate, um, we witnessed uh, the uh, significant uh, foreign interference allegations or threats during the 2016 uh, presidential election in the United States, where uh, Russia certainly through misinformation and disinformation online uh, attempted to interfere. Uh, 
But also, more interestingly, as a key example, in 2017, during the French presidential election, there was actually a moment in which uh, officials within the French governmental apparatus actually had to come out and tell uh, the citizens of France that a particular piece of information or news that was about to break was in fact uh, Russian disinformation and should not be uh, given any weight or heed. That got us to reflecting on whether or not Canada had a potential to intercede in an election campaign uh, if there was a, a significant threat of foreign interference impacting the ability in fair way. Uh, so we uh, got them here in Canada, which ended up being two mechanisms force that allows uh, our security agencies to monitor very closely the goings on in the election. And the panel of five, uh, which is top civil servants who would have uh, the ability, if they deemed it necessary, to actually go public um, or take other actions to ensure the uh, protection of our, our uh, democratic institutions and electoral process. One of the other examples of things that we've uh, when Canada hosted the G7 uh, leaders actually brought forward and created the G7 rapid response mechanism, which was designed uh, to monitor and respond to uh, threats of misinformation and disinformation in uh, our democracies, uh, a tool that has been in a number of different occasions and indeed was uh, more recently actually strengthened uh, to weigh in a little more on uh, the democracies in Eastern Europe, where we're seeing significant interference by uh, uh, Russians, given the, the conflict in Ukraine. Okay, thank you for that summary. Um, what I'm going to try and get at now is uh, the threats, really, to which all of this responds. So we heard from Minister Gould this morning about the, the plan to protect Canada's democracy and, and what it was really designed to, to do, that, that process. Uh, Mr. Clerk, I'm going to ask you to pull up a document, uh, CAN 019496. So, Mr. of information, or at least that was, was uh, available to you at that time, and that's what I'm going to bring out here. So if we, this is a memo that was written to you by David Morrison, your NSIA at the time, uh, and you received it in June 2017. So the, the top of that um, document there talks about the Chinese foreign in interference threat, and it says, the CSIS describes the PRC essentially as sophisticated, pervasive, persistent. There are other countries around, but the PRC is the big one. Mr. Clerk, if you can just scroll down a little bit more. Okay, um, scroll down, scroll down, I'll tell you when to stop. Keep going. Okay, there we go. So uh, on the third page here, you'll see Prime Minister, it talks about allies who are facing similar challenges and refers specifically to Australia, in which I believe what's explained there is they, uh, in Australia, it was found that agents of the Chinese government were donating millions of dollars across the political spectrum. So your NSIA is informing you of this. And keep scrolling down, please, Mr. Clerk, to the next page. And then brings it back to Canada. Um, oh, sorry, scroll down a little bit more, please, Mr. Clerk, till the next page. PCO comments. There we go. Okay, last page. Politicians and elected officials, in particular at the provincial, territorial, and municipal levels, are largely
This is a very sensitive issue, and public efforts to to raise awareness should remain general and not single out specific countries to avoid potential bilateral incidents. However, countries across the line should be reminded of appropriate conduct and risk of consequences. So, Mr. Prime Minister, I'd like you to speak to those points, if you can. First of all, the level of not coming from the PRC, and also that foreign interference while at the same time alike? Um, well, first of all, it's a good example, as I spoke about the um, experiences in the United States and in France. Uh, the experience that Australia had, uh, not with Russia, but with China, is uh, another excellent example that we were very aware of at the time. Uh, and highly highlighted the fact that there are uh, foreign state actors who are uh, interested in playing a role in, in, uh, in our democracies or in disrupting our democracies. The difference between Russia and China is a significant one in that China has a, a, a very large diaspora of Chinese Canadians who are uh, often the first uh, targets of interference uh, efforts by uh, a foreign state, uh, by that foreign state. So we were very aware of it. As a politician in Canada for um, eight years when I became prime minister, uh, I was certainly aware of the various ways um, officials and different countries, particularly Canadian political processes, but Uh, in 2015, maybe into 2016, our national security officials. Some of the things uh, understood as opposition politicians now in a position of being in government that we wanted to understand more about the role of communities and you know, we even wanted to know about particular individuals that we had heard things about uh, and understand what lens because we suddenly had access to a very sophisticated and uh, excellent national security apparatus that when one is a simple opposition politician, you don't have access to. So from the very beginning, we knew there were things we needed to know about. This uh, 2017 memo is certainly a continuation of uh, that level of awareness. The issue of it being a sensitive issue uh, is, um, is quite germane, uh, and it evolves over time. Uh, back in the early days of our government, we were very much uh, looking to deepen the trade and commercial ties with China, uh, seeing it as an opportunity for exports. One of my biggest files of the day on that was trying to uh, restore the canola shipments that many uh, Western grain farmers were relying on uh, that were seeing um, irregular blockages uh, from the Chinese authorities. So that was part of our work. But even as we were doing that, we were very aware of the areas in which we needed to uh, challenge or contest China, whether it was on issues of human rights or democracy, of uh, Uyghurs, of uh, uh, our, uh, our diaspora communities from Uh, they chose to arbitrarily detain two Canadians close to three years. Uh, we were back hard against China on um, the tensions and the fact that they needed to release those two Canadians. But we were extremely active around the world in mobilizing other countries to bring up 
uh, Canada and the plight of the two Michaels uh, during their bilateral conversations, which was something I can say um, ended up putting a significant amount of um, strain on our relationship because it was a massive irritant to China that everyone kept talking about these two Michaels even when uh, they didn't have anything to do with Canada. We heard it regularly, but that was what we continue to do. Um, it perhaps came to the, the, the greatest sort of head in terms of um, being reminded c'est-à-dire que cela nous rappelait les contacts appropriés et les conséquences possibles. Democratic processes, because that was very much uh, something that uh, people were very concerned about that back home. Um, we'll move then to the front picture of to some more precise questions. Je vais commencer en français, Monsieur. Maintenant, et on va parler d'un sujet. So now let's move. It has to do with the way that you receive information, uh, intelligence information. Now, in your interview and previous testimony, the written documents were not necessarily a reflection of the information you received. And in fact, it's the ver main part of your briefings. Can you explain that to us and the way you receive uh, the information you need? Well, first of all, any prime minister receives countless briefings, receives countless information, not only on foreign interference or national security issues, but on the economy or uh, public security issues, um, concerns shared by allies. I am constantly in receiving mode of all kinds of information from departments and advisors across government. I, of course, also follow the headlines to know what Canadians are reading about, hearing about, what they are concerned about in their daily lives. Now, all of this information is presented in different ways, but despite the fact that I receive written information, uh, briefs on intelligence, the only make me aware of a priority issue is I'm traveling or if I'm particularly is the best way to convey information to me is to receive a direct briefing from my national security advisor and intelligence advisor updates, usually on several topics um, during the same session, and this would happen on a regular basis. Sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes it's only three or four times a month. It all depends. But the only way to guarantee to make sure that I receive the necessary information is to give me an in-person briefing or over a secure line, if necessary, on any issue or priority issue. Now, you mentioned the NSIA, so the National Security and Intelligence Advisor. Is this the person you depend on the most to provide you with the information you need in this area, or do you get the information from the clerk or from both? 
Well, in that particular field, it is the NSIA to um, keep me fully briefed on everything I need to know and to answer any questions I might have about security or intelligence. So she is the person I turn to to get the answers I need. The uh, clerk often has a role to play to uh, bring priority issues to my attention. Um, it could be security or intelligence uh, issues, but it's mostly the NSIA who is mandated with um, keeping me fully briefed on security and intelligence issues. When you received that, I ask you to explain to us how you respond, how you react. Can you tell us of staff, Ms. Telford, yesterday testified that she received some information or security or intelligence products with a certain degree of uh, reserve and does not necessarily take the information at face value. Sometimes the information might be erroneous. And I would like to know what you think about that based on your experience. Well, in politics, there is a principle, especially uh, for those who are giving briefing or passing along information to a minister or to the prime minister, that if you are not sure about what you are conveying, you might not want to convey it. You cannot give a minister or the prime minister uh, wrong information before they rise in the House or speak publicly. This could be very prob problematic. So when I receive information on an incident which has occurred or on any kind of concern or on a natural disaster or an issue Canadians need to deal with, well, the veracity of the information, the accuracy of the information, the, its completeness is very important. However, I would make an exception with regard to intelligence. When you receive intelligence, it's not legal circles, it's well known that the difference between between those two issues. So when I receive a briefing, whether it's in writing or more frequently verbally, officials the reliability of the information being said, for instance, when I was briefed on the fact that Iran had uh, shot down a Ukrainian airline uh, on which 100 Canadians were on board, the first report were a little more vague. However, they told me they had indications that A, B, or C. And then at the next briefing, there was a lot more information. They knew that Iranian armed forces had shot down that Ukrainian aircraft. So what I am saying is that you have to take this intelligence, you have to take this information with a certain awareness, that it still needs to be confirmed or it might not be 100% accurate because it is very sensitive information. Take 
like a, receive a report on Canada's unemployment rate or inflation rate. So there is a certain degree, I would not say skepticism, but of critical thought that must be applied to any uh, information. Um, I'm going to take you to the 20. Pull up uh, CAN 005461, please. So, Prime Minister, this is, while well, it's getting pulled up, yep, there it is. Um, we know at this point in the, uh, the evidence before the... This gave a briefing to uh, the security cleared representative of the Liberal Party about foreign interference in the Don Valley North riding. We also know from Mr. Broadhurst that he then received that information. How did this play out from your perspective? Uh, late in September, uh, as I was coming through Ottawa, um, I believe I was on my way out uh, across the country for a, a, another stretch of campaigning. Um, I believe it was on a Sunday as I was, I was heading out after Saturday with, uh, with my family. Uh, Mr. Broadhurst um, met me at the airport uh, in a, a holding room, in a lounge uh, on the, uh, the um, government side of the airport, government terminal in the airport, uh, to let me know of concerns that he had received from the site task force and uh, CSIS about the nomination campaign, the nomination uh, election, um, the nomination race contest in uh, Don Valley North. He shared with me um, that the intelligence services had shared with him concerns, had developing plans to possibly interference in the nomination contest, uh, specifically uh, by mobilizing buses uh, filled with, and I'm, uh, it, the challenge in this is always trying to pick out what I heard exactly then from what I knew later, but I believe it was either buses full of students or buses filled with Chinese speakers or Chinese diaspora members who would be mobilized uh, to support Han Dong, uh, who would have been mobilized to support Han Dong uh, in that nomination uh, contest of a few weeks previous. Uh, in what ended up being probably a 20 minute to half hour conversation with Mr. Broadhurst, I asked him uh, more specifically about, um, okay, so they had plans or an intent or a capacity to do this. Do we know that they did? Did you hear from CSIS and, and the security agencies that this was actually done? Um, he, they weren't entirely certain. There was reasons to believe that perhaps it has and perhaps there were, the indication was that there were buses that nomination contest. Um, I asked, of course, those who are in uh, politics and certainly uh, on the ground riding politics know that it is regular for buses to be student groups, uh, you know, a particular uh, full of seniors to participate in, in a nomination contest. So just the existence of buses wasn't enough, buses with uh, Chinese speakers or Mandarin speakers in them wasn't enough to um, be itself uh, alarming or, or a, 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 a condemnation, but it was, there were clear indications that there were concerns by CSIS that China 
and that those students or those individuals on the bus might have been motivated uh, or brought, mobilized to vote in that way, and these, there were concerns that CSIS had. I asked um, the extent to which they were certain that it happened, the extent to which they were certain that China was indeed behind the mobilizing of the bus or buses. And I also asked uh, whether or not CSIS had information that Han Dong knew about this, whether he was a witting and aware that China had mobilized or Chinese officials had mobilized buses for him or not. And the answers, answers were not clear from CSIS at that point, uh, according to what Mr. Broadhurst told me. I then uh, asked, I also asked if, um, if it was a close nomination, if there was a sense that the actual result of the nomination uh, could have been affected by this bus or buses or what was there, and that wasn't clear at all. CSIS didn't have any conclusions to share at that point. Um, I asked Mr. Broadhurst uh, whether CSIS was making any uh, recommendations or uh, suggestions as to what we should do with this information. And it was clear um, to Mr. Broadhurst that this was very much about just letting us know so that we know and could perhaps um, take any actions that we deemed um, appropriate, but they weren't going to be recommending for us to take. Also specified uh, that um, this was uh, secret information that we could not share with the candidate in question, Mr. Dong. Uh, or the public at large uh, in terms of, of what they were telling us about these concerns and this allega these allegations. I then asked Mr. Broadhurst um, what the Liberal Party nominations, particularly contested nominations, had flagged around that nomination contest of a few weeks before. Um, there are party officials that oversee uh, the voting, the registrations, the voting, the processes, the counting. There are lawyers in place overseeing the count. Uh, there are possibilities for the losing contestant or contestants uh, to challenge uh, the result if they feel it was unfair. There are many processes because um, political parties often have some very uh, complex uh, fights around nomination uh, parties, all uh, nomination contests, all political parties are like that. Um, and Mr. Broadhurst uh, assured me that they had looked into when they heard uh, these allegations or this information from CSIS uh, and CITE and had no flags on the nomination process. Um, so then I had uh, uh, what was a brief conversation with Mr. Broadhurst uh, after we had established all that. Um, to sort of agree that the threshold for overturning like an official party nomination to find out um, particularly during an election, general election, for removal of that candidate. And that was really sort of the binary choice uh, we were placed within that situation. Acting would be removing Han Dong as our official candidate. Um, the other choice would be not to remove that candidate. Even not having removed that candidate, we would have to revisit there would be questions we would have to follow up on um, after the election to properly understand what, uh, what happened and what, what the issues or the risks were in this situation. But understanding that the decision to um, remove someone needed a high threshold, a threshold that incidentally I have um, 
met and seen many other cases. As Liberal Party leader, I have, uh, on many, many different occasions, uh, had to uh, ask people to step down or step away or desist as candidates for the Liberal Party. Yes. Most recently, it's the last election where we did that in the, in the case of uh, a downtown Toronto riding. Um, but in this case, I didn't feel that there was sufficient or sufficiently credible information that that would justify this um, very significant step as to um, uh, in these circumstances. So where does that leave you? Put it as a pretty binary choice there, but you a classified information that you can't share. What are you able to do? Where does this leave a political party receiving this information? Um, after the election, when we were out of caretaker period, where I went back to being primarily prime minister and not um, simply leader of a political party with uh, 338 candidates across the country, um, I was able to turn to our um, intelligence agencies and say, uh, we need to know, know more about this. Uh, we need to understand what the context is because the answers that we get on that will have a bearing on choices we could make in the future. Uh, responsibilities for a, an individual in uh, such a situation. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to some other things now because we have a lot to cover in 75 minutes. Um, okay, so the next topic then, uh, Mr. Clerk, you can pull this up, CAN 003116, but Prime Minister, I think I can ask you this question without reference to a document. An incident that was reported by the RRM in the 29th election had to do with an article um, published in the Buffalo Chronicle some misinformation, false information about you specifically. Is that something that came to your attention in the 2019 election? Uh, no, it did not. No, it did not. Okay. Sorry, the, the engagement of the uh, site task force or the panel or anyone into that issue was not something I was aware of at the time. I was, of course, uh, aware of uh, the... Um, quite disgusting, um, false uh, conspiracies or, or allegations and a significant number of uh, conservative politicians. So the, the apparatus was dealing with it. I, I, I may have been aware of the article. I was certainly aware of the allegations and the accusations that were heinous and untrue in uh, in that. Okay. Um, I think that's probably what we'll cover for 2019, although I do want to pull up uh, CAN 015. Prime Minister, this is the memo from David Morrison. I misspoke earlier. Uh, this is January 14th, 2020, I think, when you received this. And it's essentially a report on the 2019 election, not on the outcome of the election, but on the operation of the, the site task force and the panel. Mr. Clerk, can you scroll down to the third bullet, please? Actually, could I just quickly look at the box? Yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah, the, the third bullet. Yes, that's fine. Okay, so what they say here is pre-election intel briefings and monitoring provided a baseline assessment, uh, suggesting that and foreign interference would be commensurate to overall interference campaigns. While some in instances were noted and some TRMs, TRM as a threat reduction measure were taken, none of these activities met the threshold. And then Mr. Clerk, can you keep scrolling down? Next page. Keep going, I'll tell you when to stop. Nope, I think we may. Oh, no, there we go. Okay. Um, it says, as it pertains to FI and as referenced above, despite concerns that Canada would be targeted, and then I'm going to go through this quite quickly, but there, the assessment is there was no foreign cyber threat activity targeting Elections Canada, no instances of foreign interference in the human space, no significant indications of FI in the digital 
apply in GE 2019 below the with the information that was being provided to you about what happened in GE 2019? Uh, yes, uh, this this was a a report in January of, of 2020, so three months uh, after the election, um, I would have already have been briefed multiple times by the clerk and by others uh, that their conclusion was that the elections in 2019 were indeed free and fair and uh, the outcome was uh, not affected by foreign interference either overall or in uh, um, so now let's leave 2019 and move to the 2021 election. I'm going to ask you about a series of some incidents uh, or events that, about which the Commission has received information. And I'll do the first one with reference to one of the topical summaries that's been produced at the Commission by the government. So, Mr. Clerk, that's Can Sum 4. The title of this one is a bit of a tongue twister, but Possible People's Republic of China Foreign Interference Related Mis- or Disinformation. So what we have here, if you can scroll down past the caveat page, Mr. Clerk, is a summary of uh, essentially allegations of misinformation about the Conservative Party, its leader Aaron O'Toole, um, and I think Kenny Chu is in there as well. Uh, that were circulating during the 2021 election. So my question to you, Prime Minister, is, is this something that you were aware of as it was occurring in 2021? Uh, during the 2021 election, no. Shortly after the 2021 election, when the Conservative Party uh, went public with its concerns in the sort of the week that followed, I learned about it through media reports. Okay. Um, and were you aware that the Conservative Party had raised those concerns with the government as well? Not at the time, but later I would learn that through, uh, through briefings. Okay. Months later. The next one then is... Um, is the next one? Can some 13, please? about both 2019 and 2021, the more germane one, maybe 2021. Can you scroll down to the uh, information page? Thank you, Mr. Clark. So what this summarizes, you'll see, is expressions of partisan preferences by certain PRC officials in Canada uh, is that there was reporting that some PRC officials expressed political preferences, which were party agnostic and opportunistic at a writing level. So then scrolling down, please, again, Mr. Clerk, in 2021, there was Canada made comments expressing a preference for a Liberal Party minority government. The rationale was they don't perceive any of the political parties as being particularly pro-China, but perceived minority governments as being more limited in terms of acting, enacting anti-China policies. So this reporting of an expressed preference by certain PRC officials for a liberal minority, was that something of which you were aware at the time? No. Um, as I said, both the 2019 and 2021 elections happened in a context of uh, significant tensions between our government and the government of the People's Republic of China, uh, particularly over the uh, illegal and arbitrary detention of two Canadian citizens, the two Michaels. Um, we were extremely active uh, both in pushing back at uh, Chinese officials uh, on this issue, uh, but also, as I said, active around the world in uh, drumming up support uh, for people for the two, uh, for different countries for the two Michaels, but also arbitrary detention uh, and how it shouldn't be used as a tool of uh, political uh, political. Uh, so, you know, I can. consistently would get is that the actual 
no it would seem very improbable uh, that itself would have a preference in an, in the election. So I take it from this that whatever intelligence reporting there was on that, it did not reach your ears. That down now, Mr. And Clark. there's also a, 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 the issue of the difference between foreign interference and um, attempts by different countries to influence behavior. Um, diplomats around the world are in their roles to try and influence uh, favorable behaviors by the countries in which they're serving towards the country they represent. That is a big part of the role of, uh, of a diplomat, of a foreign official, uh, of all types. Canadians certainly uh, take, um, take an active role in furthering our interests, including uh, from time to time, uh, having certain preferences around what might happen or might, might be an outcome of an election or a particular uh, domestic debate in, in a foreign country. However, um, foreign interference uh, happens when there is, and there's a full proper definition of it somewhere, but my understanding is uh, where it's um, covert, where it's uh, coercive, uh, where it is uh, using uh, pressure or, or particularly um, untoward means other than having express, yeah, I really hope you should sign this trade deal, means to get them to sign said trade deal or Matt to express a preference or what have you um, is not in itself foreign interference. Uh, it may be attempts at influence. It may not be anything other than the regular concept of, of diplomacy. So it further their preference that would constitute potentially foreign interference. And, and certainly in the case of China, we have seen regularly that, that many examples of this commission that there are clear actions that would uh, amount to or, or indicate uh, a willingness to engage in foreign interference. Okay. Um, the, the next incident uh, I want to bring you to is CAN001082, Mr. Clark. This is another briefing, Prime Minister, that was given to the cleared representative of the Liberal Party at the time, it's the 2021 election this time. Uh, you probably, judging from that document, can't say very much about this, but um, what I'm interested in knowing here is the timing of how this one played out, again, from your perspective. So we know that the briefing it was actually on the 12th of September, I believe, not the 11th, as this document indicates, but it was given again to the Liberal Party representative and then to Mr. Broadhurst, and we've heard Mr. Broadhurst's evidence on it, so now we'd like yours. Um, my understanding is, which I learned uh, after the election was over, was that Mr. Broadhurst made the determination that it wasn't something that he needed to bring to my attention as leader of the Liberal Party, and he did not. He did not bring it to your attention? He did not bring it to my attention. During the election? During the election, yes. After the election? Uh, uh, more official briefings on, on this matter. Okay. He, he, was, he was the vehicle for officials, because that's the way it would flow through as party leader, in my party leader role. Um, Prime Minister, it was officials who would be able to brief me on this. Okay. Um, speaking of briefings, we're going to turn to that topic. You or we think you received, we do know you. Over the relevant time period. Uh, 
start with um, February 9th, 2021. This one, I don't really have a document to point you to, so I'm just gonna ask you for your recollection of it. So this would be, again, February, 20, February 9th, I'm sorry, 2021. Do you recall receiving a briefing on that date? Uh, yes, uh, that was uh, a briefing uh, that I got on uh, on the phone. I was not uh, not in person for that briefing. I was there via uh, teleconference on on a secure phone. And uh, yes, I got a briefing. Okay. Do you recall the content of that briefing at all? It was a, as I recall, a a, a general briefing on a number of uh, issues, including foreign interference. Okay. The next one then in time, Mr. Clerk, can you pull up CAN 0? Okay, this document, which has been talked about quite a bit in these proceedings, is briefing notes. Again, can you scroll down just so the Prime Minister can see a bit of the document and its content. So Prime Minister's briefing in the fall of 2022, October 27th. In the place where I got the briefing. So I, uh, I remember very clearly this briefing. Um, this briefing was actually uh, cases and situations to do with federal elections. Okay, so would you say that the content of this particular, these notes, these briefing notes, accurately conveys what you were told during uh, that briefing? Not particularly. Um, obviously, uh, there are elements uh, in this that are um, consistent with the briefing that was uh, on different elements of foreign interference. Uh, but when it comes to briefings, uh, and others uh, can speak to this and how they make decisions about what to read from their prepared notes, during an actual briefing uh, with, uh, with uh, ministers or, or a prime minister. Um, but it is much more of a that talk about how serious for it more, that wouldn't have been something that advisors or whoever would have had to spend much time on because they would have known that we did understand how serious foreign interference is and how much we take it seriously. And actually that was why we would spend more time that were really the meat of the brief. Notes are prepared for the briefers, what actually becomes the most important thing that I certainly recall about those briefings was the various and specific cases we went through and how they are examples of concern or not concern that we then have to behave in certain ways or have follow-ups on this or that. I mean, it is, much less a large theoretical briefing and much more concrete. This is a situation. And then the discussion about how we deal with this particular situation or example or another would be where the, the larger theoretical discussion and implications would come in, but they would be concentrated around specific uh, individuals or cases. Okay. So maybe we'll pull up now, uh, Ms. Telsford, notes from that meeting. So that's CAN 009803. 
a little more sparse than Brian Klaus would be, but at least we have a few points here. Um, do these notes help shed any light on, on what was dealt with in that briefing for you, Prime Minister? Do these seem familiar? Um, yes, I think the, the one, two, three uh, indicates that different uh, uh, examples that we were, or the ex situations, or, or actually there are cases uh, that we were talking about, or individuals we were talking about. Um, and the bragging is not doing uh, definitely, um, definitely uh, helps me recall uh, a part of the conversation where there was, and let me be careful how I say this so it's not identifiable. Uh, there was a foreign government official based in Canada who was taking credit um, for a certain thing having happened in Canada um, in their reporting to a superior or to, to their home country. Uh, and just the fact that a foreign official was taking credit for having um, delivered a particular outcome in no way meant that anything that particular official did actually created the outcome. Bragging is not doing. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, wanting to write back home to say, we got the outcome we wanted, perhaps, um, when that individual may not have had any actual bearing on the outcome of um, the particular event. Okay. I don't know if that's sufficiently clear for what it was. It, it is. And thank you. Um, the last document maybe on this point, uh, 4097. Sorry. No, sorry, four zero seven nine. My bad. There we go. Okay, so again, these are notes from that day. So if you can have a quick look at these, Prime Minister. the non-redacted parts of these. And what you'll see there is a text box over information that's been redacted but summarized by the commission. Does this seem familiar as information that was discussed at that meeting? During that same October, uh, October meeting? Sorry, what was that? The yes. actions on a document that I, I would never have seen. Fair enough. Okay, uh, next one then is November 30th, 2022. Can we pull up please, Mr. Clerk, CAN 014285. So this is a memo to you, Prime Minister, of November 30th, 2022. And Mr. Clerk, again, if you can scroll down so the Prime Minister can see the document, pass the transmittal note. It's a memorandum for you by the NSIA, copy to the clerk, claims of foreign interference in the 2019 general election for information. And the context of this Prime Minister is this is shortly after their the media leaks have started about foreign interference. So a memo was written, and we can again scroll through a bit to, to see the content of that memo. You 
could just keep going a little faster than that. I'm not really gonna stop on anything. But I will ask you now that you've seen it a little bit to just scroll back up to the summary part, Mr. Clerk. Okay. What's happening here is uh, the NSIA and PC. A, that identified a single PCO since 2020, which is the one that we've seen earlier, on uh, briefing. Is that consistent with your recollection of when you were briefed on these, these issues? Um, sorry, is, is this note of uh, November 30th, 2022, was when we were uh, asked on you know, what uh, may have happened, uh, and uh, we were asking uh, were these things that we were flagged at that time. Uh, and yes, that's that's. The single PCO information note dated to January uh, 24th, 2020. Um, and then the February 9th, 2021 briefing. So well, all I'm asking is whether that's consistent with your recollection of when you were briefed on these issues. But I, I wasn't, I, th th these were uh, requests I was, I was made, or I made a request to our national security and intelligence advisor because there were things being alleged in the leaks that we had not been briefed on. So I'm not entirely certain about the briefing dates there uh, given because there were things, including those 11 candidates uh, as, as, as a quote, uh, that we had never been briefed on until we saw the leaks. Right. So I guess maybe this particular document I'm not asking you about, except of when you were briefed, the January 2020. January 2020. Was the memo that we looked at earlier. David Morrison memo? Right. I, I never... I got briefed on the contents, which was basically that um, foreign interference was uh, lower than expected and the elections were free and fair in 2019. Those were the, the top level conclusions that I were, was briefed on. 19 election, by the time we got around to January, um, it was good to have that report. I ended up reading the, uh, the, the Judd report, I believe, was the um, um, full assessment of the work that Site and the panel did uh, during the 2019 election, but I did not read that. Uh, I did not receive that January 24th uh, uh, note because I'd already been briefed on its entire contents. Okay. Uh, and then the February 9th, 2021, what note was that was that was the phone brief that we spoke about earlier. Yes. Right. I guess that goes back to your point about oral briefings or what really get to you, not necessarily the written ones. OK, um, can we then pull up, Mr. Clerk, can zero one seven six seven three. And, and, and let me just I mean, I wouldn't want to give people the impression that that um, briefings weren't something particularly uh, intelligence briefings we took very, very seriously. In most of these secure briefings, which would go into a, a SCIF, a secure compartmentalized room, um, told, we were told to leave our and our Fitbits, make sure we're totally secure within a fair Often being told, no, we can't. 
documents that are given, but we then need to return them to the uh, to the uh, uh, the officials. Um, certainly, in the beginning. Uh, we were never clear on whether we could take notes on this either because security was important for Brian Cloud does take notes. Um, but that um, there, there was lots of written material and lots of tracking of that information as a government must and taking very seriously all these things in very careful controls. But when it came to uh, briefing and taking actions and understanding the context, it happened through uh, secure briefings and conversations that were uh, primarily um, us receiving information, us asking questions, us um, directing um, further actions or research in this area or that area that they would then take away and do. I wouldn't want anyone to think that, oh, because the briefings were primarily oral or, for example, that, uh, uh, that David Morrison memo uh, I didn't read um, because it wasn't delivered to me because I got the content in the fact that the election was integrity um, we'll just go to some other notes then. I think, I believe. Me too. Uh, do you recall this? Um, my notes indicate that this was uh, immediately before question period, a briefing uh, that happened over lunch hour as I was preparing to go in to uh, deal with uh, some, some fairly um, intense uh, questioning on the issue of foreign interference, given the explosive nature of the uh, media uh, stories uh, stemming from uh, unsubstantiated and uncorroborated intelligence shared by uh, a leaker. Um, so these were, you know, th these were conversations around what I could say and what uh, uh, what uh, we uh, we could and couldn't say uh, around uh, around some of the these allegations that were in the paper, uh, but would leave us limited on rebut, regardless of the fact that there was, uh, there were inconsistencies, there were uncorroborated information in the leaks. Uh, there were also things that were flat out wrong, but um, I was reminded of, of the the old story of uh, uh, some FBI uh, agent questioning a, a, a witness in an organized crime situation and saying, well, did you meet with that mobster in LA? The guy says, I can't comment. Did you meet with that mobster in Detroit? I can't comment. Did you meet with that lob mobster in Miami? No, I definitely did not. Um, you know, the, sometimes in denying something, you're giving information you couldn't and, and throughout uh, my preoccupation and why these leaks um, was that we couldn't actually correct affirming the tradecraft and the work that uh, women and men in relied upon by our security agencies to keep them at risk uh, without sharing with some of the information or the methods uh, that we use uh, to keep Canadians safe. And that's part of the reason for the um, complex nature of a public of foreign interference, that if we say certain things or if we contradict or deny other things, we could be giving our adversaries tools uh, to actually uh, understand how we go about detecting their um, interference or, or uh, um, illicit ways of engaging to harm Canadians. It's a complex problem. Um, so the next, uh, I'm going to keep going with the briefings and the, the post-leak world briefings specifically, Prime Minister. 
not long left, but uh, CAN 018009. So these are notes from the date on the notes is March 19th, but we know it was actually March 20th. So this is March 20th, 2023, a meeting at which you were present and I believe your staff was present and a number of senior national security uh, officials. So if we scroll down, so it's the content of this document or the unredacted content of what was happening at this meeting to, uh, yeah, a little higher. PM, that's me. Uh, speaking of nominations, we were talking about, thank you for uh, uh, We were talking about the next, who the next speaker was that's redacted. Uh, but um, the emphasis on charter rights uh, or the bringing up of charter rights and further down uh, PM, no June 2019 uh, meeting. Um, those are two examples of us uh, working constructively with um, CSIS and, and the intelligence agencies to, um, to better understand and validate certain pieces of information. Um, for example, um, in the information we were seeing, we'd seen that CSIS had a source uh, that said that uh, there was a um, June 2019 meeting that I was at um, that I can clearly and unequivocally at the time and since then confirm uh, never happened. I did not have the meeting that the source had set. Now, this doesn't mean that CSIS got it wrong. It meant that CSIS was now able to validate that what their source had said in this situation was wrong. And therefore, that puts a particular understanding or color on their ability to interpret other statements of fact or supposed fact that that source Made. And that's part of how intelligence work happens. When when you know for sure when a source says something that you can source says something that you can then verify was wrong. Uh, it's important for us to highlight, for example, in that meeting that there was no uh, no meeting uh, as was described by that source. Uh, similarly, on the question of charter rights, that was a slightly different tweak. Where in the uh, CSIS analysis. Uh, the analyst had highlighted that there was uh, possible violations of people's charter rights in a particular situation. Uh, and we had asked and pressed for uh, more sort of legal or judicial analysis of that assertion within because it didn't quite ring um, true to our instincts as political actors in terms of the analysis that CSOS was making. Again, it's part of the process that one goes through as you engage with um, the experts in foreign intelligence and, and uh, security uh, in an active way to try and make sure we're understanding, getting the accurate picture and, and able to then continue to keep both Canadians and our institutions safe through the various jobs we do. Madame la Commissaire, I think I'm out of time. May vous me permettez une dernière question? Certainement. Parfait. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm going to sort of ask you to conclude this. May I have a last question, Madame Commissioner? Yes. So we've heard about the existence of foreign interference, the pervasiveness of the threat, and various measures that, as you said, have been put in place to combat this. Um, you may know that earlier in these proceedings, we heard from a number of individuals who are being targeted by potential foreign interference in some ways. And there have been calls for the government to do more uh, than it's And in particular, I'm going to take you, I'll just read you.
potential PRC misinformation. But we he said, uh, it's almost like I was the way is to let me know that I'm drowning. I don't need their notification. I need their help. So, Prime Minister, I'd like to hear the, your response to that. Actually, maybe in, in providing this response phase of the Commission's work. Um, a bit of a step back uh, and the idea that, you know, we need to do more. I agree. Um, when, when we took office in 2015, there was very little, if any, uh, mechanisms to counter foreign interference. Yes, our intelligence agencies uh, did good work, but the idea or the priority of protecting our democracy, um, particularly when it comes comes to misinformation, disinformation, uh, active engagement uh, in various um, diaspora communities or, or uh, electoral events um, was not on the radar uh, at all uh, when we took office. Um, it hadn't been something that the previous government or any previous government had done much on at all. So we started from a standing start. Um, we created the National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. Uh, we created NCIRA. Um, we moved forward to the rapid response mechanism and we've continued uh, to do more. Yes, the panel for the 2019 and 2021 elections site, uh, but we've continued uh, we recently brought in a National Security Committee, National Security Council uh, of Cabinet uh, to address sort of strategic tools and powers and learning from uh, 2019 and 2021 that they'll be able to apply uh, in, uh, in the 2025 uh, election when it's uh, likely to come. There is always more to do and one of the things I'm very much looking forward to um, coming from the work uh, this, uh, uh, this commission is doing is to make recommendations on how uh, we can strengthen even further the uh, protection of institutions and of our democracy. The other half is in their institutions and their democracy. Uh, and whether it's a, a diaspora member um, worried about stepping up to running for uh, elected office in this country because they're worried about the impact that might be real or perceived from uh, a country they chose to left, leave many years ago for whatever reasons. Um, there are real concerns and feelings involved. And ultimately, democracy only works when people are confident in its ability to keep them safe, but also be the articulation of what they want for their community and their country. That's where confidence in the integrity of the elections in 2019, 2021 is so important and something that we have emphasized throughout this process that the every briefing I've ever got from all my intelligence and uh, security experts, thing we have seen and heard, despite, yes, attempts states to interfere. The feeling that individuals can have that maybe our institutions aren't so strong. Maybe they are impacted by foreign actors who wish to do ill to Canada and to Canadians. Very thoughtful about. And one of the ways ultimately safe is to make sure that citizens themselves 
critical thinkers who are empowered to see what is information, what is misinformation or disinformation, and use whatever direction they want for the country. And we've seen with the intensity of misinformation and disinformation, not just from foreign actors, but just on social media generally in many pockets, that um, it's not automatic. Democracy requires constant vigilance and constant hard work. It didn't happen by accident, it doesn't continue without effort. It's not just effort of commissioners and politicians and spooks. It's efforts of every single individual to feel like they have the full ability to engage in our democratic processes and to feel that they are safe and protected as they engage, whether it's as a voter or a candidate or, or, a, or an elected member of parliament or of, of provincial parliament or, or wherever. These are together on and I, I am in constant awe across this country who continues to put up their hands for a more difficult uh, and more and more challenging discourse to say, no, I want to members of diaspora communities, but of Canadian experiences is the only way to make sure that we're actually building the kind of country we need to be. Who steps up and will continue to commit myself things of safety as we involve it engage as citizens or more as our democracy um, are protected. Madame le Commissaire, ce sont mes questions. Merci. I have no, no more questions. À votre connaissance, existe-t-il un mécanisme As far as you know, do, do you have a mechanism or a procedure in place that will ensure that <laughs> The NSIA would constantly have access and receive information relating to foreign interference. And sir, the NSIA has a role of collecting and looking for all the information available in all of our security agencies, whether it's at the defense level or whether it's at uh, foreign affairs or, 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 the, or any other security agency. That is the person who is beside me to coordinate that universe. So she has the capacity and the ability to look for those answers. For example, when I woke up this morning, I saw some reports in the media no matter the universe or the place in the security and intelligence universe where information is available, she has access to that universe. She is the person towards which everything uh, questions. So I understand that she has whether it's the agencies or the, min or the departments and departments transmit information regarding foreign Sir, I am confident that she the information that find relevant, but as we always be improved with respect to how the different 
different departments and the different uh, levels of government work together. And the very existence of the NSIA ensures that we have a point of a connection between authority and uh, uh, gives her a capacity to collect information from everywhere. Question, when you receive in information, intelligence that is, that may not have been corroborated as of yet, but that are likely to be very important, that could have a significant impact, could you ask the agencies by setting up a priority list to complete or to follow through with those investigations? Answers, absolutely. And often, and in almost every situation, when I say there's a follow-up on you should follow up on this. The answer I receive is we are doing that and this is what we're doing. Of course, the uh, work that uh, the agencies do does not need for a minister to ask for a follow up. They will follow up on preoccupying uh, uh, situations. Yes, a government or a prime minister can uh, highlight something, can put pressure to accelerate things or send more resources, but our systems and our agencies in the area of security have the mandates and the responsibilities to follow up on uh, preoccupying situations. Question. So we could, um, you could amend things? Answer yes. So we would have a regular reflection on our priorities with respect to security uh, for our country. We could lay more emphasis on cybersecurity, for example. When we see what the emphasis was 10 years ago, it's very different. The world is changing. The reality of our world is that uh, the balance of powers are changing. Russia has become extremely problematic, not just mildly problematic, as was the case 10 years ago. So we adjust regularly. And elected officials have an important role to play, indeed. But the work that our intelligence and security agencies play is that they work in a robust fashion in general. Question, when your campaign manager that there were allegations answer, with respect to the party, yes. I first asked, what information do we have in this regard? And I also asked if we could follow up, or at least the party should follow up with Elections Canada and identify the reports that were, see the reports that were written out. What were the conclusions? Do we have additional information? Well, the reality is that in highly contested nomination situations, there are usually uh, bust uh, voters. Sometimes that will be sp uh, the candidate. And in other situations, you would see buses that belong to a uh, an elder person's uh, center, and that will be used by one group or another. And in that case, you might not see receipts being submitted. In my own nomination contest that was in uh, March or April 2007, there were many buses of Italians and Greeks because that was my reality in Papineau, my writing of Papineau. So that's a common uh, occurrence. And that would not be enough to flag any situation where anybody looking at the, con the nomination contest would say that, no, we have to follow up on that. We are not. So we're not a forensic organization. 
we know that we are limited in what we question. If that was to be revisited. Visit that after the elections? Answer, yes. Uh, by the party, I'm sure, yes, there were verifications made, but the verifications were comprehensive, I'm sure of that, immediately after they were notified by the site task force. I am not sure that there was extensive research that could have lasted months or weeks because we had only the information that we had and nothing more. If there were maybe an investigation by Elections Canada because of irregularities, there could have been a follow-up, but Elections Canada would be the one to speak on that. To me, the follow-up was at the level of the possible involvement of Chinese authorities here in Canada who would have actively been interested in the uh, nomination contest of a specific candidate. That is where we would have been able to do a follow-up, not necessarily to see what was the truth of what happened during the context, because it's very difficult. To we have more clarity that a Chinese authority may have had for a specific candidate. Commissioner says thank you. We are supposed to take a break. A little bit, so I suggest, um, I suggest a 10 minutes break, actually. So we'll come back at uh, 5, uh, 5.15. Order, please. Adult, s'il vous plaît. The sitting of the Foreign Defense Commission is in recess until 5.15. Cette séance de la Commission is back in session. Cette séance de la Commission sur l'ingérence étrangère a repris. Cross-examination is counsel for Michael Chan. Prime Minister. Give. and that we went through with Mr. Broadhurst, and that's uh, CAN 5461, please. And so this is um, the document that uh, we looked at earlier. Um, I took Mr. Broadhurst through it because I wanted uh, to have his evidence about what he uh, uh, told you. Uh, and of course, the value of this document is that it sticks to the things that we can talk about in an open uh, proceeding like this. And so I just want to show you the key points. Of course, the first one is that there were allegations of foreign interference by China in the Don Valley North nomination contest. And then secondly, if you just scroll down a little bit, please. This is the redacted bit. Thank you. That, oh, sorry. There we are. Um, the summary of the redaction is buses being used to bring international students to the nomination process in support of Han Don. And I just want to begin by noting that there's nothing in the language the students were speaking. They're described as international. Noting that is that in your uh, evidence earlier and also um, you referred to uh, people on the bus, the students, at points of Chinese speakers. Uh, do you recall that? I can take you to the passages yeah. if you like. No, no. Uh, I, no, I appreciate that. One of the 
challenges that I have is uh, remembering what I knew at a particular later I would find out more information about this means that I'm never a thousand percent precise on what it is that I knew at a particular moment. Yes, I do appreciate that. I do remember at one point uh, when we were talking about whether or not um, CSIS uh, understood how nomination races worked and how community organizations would regularly bring buses, um, there was a quote or there was someone relayed to me that one of CSIS's concerns was there were bus filled with Chinese speakers showing up at the nomination. And my response, as I sort of alluded to in my previous testimony, was, well, I had buses filled with Greek speakers and Italian speakers because in my nomination in Papineau, those were the communities that were mobilized. Um, that phrase stuck in my head, but I will admit that I do not specifically remember whether or not the Chinese speakers or Mandarin speakers report briefing that briefing on, on this particular Sunday during the campaign or not. Yes. But it certainly is consistent with this. All right. No, that's very helpful. And I will ask seven on this. Paragraph 30, which is, oh, sorry, start. Right, thank you. Um, and so the last sentence uh, is the concern was that buses of Chinese speakers had arrived at the nomination or possibly been brought into the nomination. And then if we go to paragraph 30 and just over the page, the top of the next page, a little further, there we are. Uh, Prime Minister, you see the last sentence, the central issue of concern was that buses filled with Chinese speakers could have been international students directed by the PRC. So the point that I want to make with you, Prime Minister, and it sounds to me like perhaps you've already got it, is that the, the central concern of the service here, as I understand it, is not that they were Chinese speakers. No. It's that they were directed by the PRC. Had these people been uh, students from Switzerland rather than uh, China, but were brought at the behest of China and to do China's bidding, I say the service's concerns would have been absolutely the same, which is yes. that this would be foreign interference. Yes, entirely. It All is right. not the, the nature of that. It, that is part of uh, what I remember as context around the service's concerns that China might have mobilized individuals. Yes. Thank you. And, and I appreciate you uh, acknowledging that. And I'll tell you why. And it's because, uh, as you will recall, there have been times where you have uh, let us say, cautioned us all as the news about the allegations in Don Valley North came out. And as I have, uh, as I say, let, let us say, cautioned Canadians not to uh, fall into anti-Chinese or anti-Asian. What I want to press on you here is that the ethnicity or the language of these students has never been the issue either for the service or for any right-thinking Canadian. The concern instead is that PRC was directing people, whoever they were, to go do their bidding and to help Han Dong is into his seat in Parliament. And, and you can have that concern and worry about that and worry about the consequences for our democracy without having an ounce of racial Uh, that I made in response to them uh, saying, or the suggestion that, oh, the, the concern was the bus filled with Chinese speakers. I say, that has absolutely no bearing on anything. And I want to be clear though, I, I hope it is your evidence uh, that you did not feel that uh, the service itself was acting in some racially prejudiced way. 
No, my concern was more that perhaps the service didn't understand uh, as deeply as uh, political uh, actors do uh, the prevalence of busing of different community groups in nomination campaigns. Right, and let's come to that point as well. If we could go to WIT 66, please. That's your other statement. Paragraph 24, please. Thank you. And actually, it's at the uh, top of page seven, so keep scrolling a little. Yes, stop there. In the middle of the page, Prime Minister, the fact that there were buses of Chinese-speaking people at the nomination meeting did not necessarily corroborate the allegation that the PCRPRC was responsible. And in fact, I should have read you the sentence before as well. He, meaning you, Prime Minister, also remembered that the intelligence was only an allegation, included no evidence that the people being busted polls were supported by PRC officials, right? And, and you go on to say, uh, Prime Minister, that you remembered asking uh, whether uh, the service understood uh, that busing is part of the nomination process. Is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and again, going back to the reporting I just showed you, there's obviously a reference to busing there. But what I want to suggest to you is that the emphasis, again, wasn't on the mode of travel for these people. Uh, they took buses this time, all right. They could have come some other way, and it wouldn't terribly matter for the services perspective because their concern was that they were directed by PRC and assisted in getting to the nomination place in order to, allegedly, help one candidate over another. So it, uh, the, the, the way they got there doesn't matter one way or another. I understand your point that you wanted to make sure that CSIS understood that buses per se are not a problem. But uh, my uh, proposition to you, sir, is that when you read that statement, the, the emphasis is on direction by China. Yes, they got there by buses. That's the allegation. They could have got there by tricycles. It doesn't terribly matter. The point is they were directed by China. I would suggest that it might be more difficult for a foreign actor to organize fleets of individuals showing up on tricycles uh, rather than filling But CSIS would still be concerned, and rightly so. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Um, I would like to uh, take you to the David Johnson report for a moment now. That's at COM 104. And if you'll go to page 23. Now, I forgot that this is in two columns, so I'm not sure where I'm going to find my quote. Let me read it to you. I don't think it's controversial. You may recall that Mr. Johnson, and I hope we can find it in here somewhere, but Mr. Johnson concluded in respect of the Don Valley North allegations, he said, that the irregularities were tied to the PRC consulate in Toronto. Do you recall that, sir? I can try to find it for you if you don't. Yes, there it is. Irregularities were observed. Yes, and then I, there we are, and there is, thank you very much, Prime Minister, and there is a well-grounded suspicion that the irregularities were tied to the PRC consulate in Toronto. That's what I wanted to ask you about. Now, I fully appreciate, sir, that that was not a conclusion you were able to make or prepared to make in September 2019. Uh, but my question for you is today, now that we've had Mr. Johnson's report and he's come to that conclusion, do you accept, first, that there were irregularities in that nomination contest, and secondly, that they were likely tied to the PRC consulate in Toronto? I'd suggest that um, irregularities being observed is not itself uh, enough to overturn a democratic event. Um, that a well-grounded suspicion uh, is certainly warranting more, uh, but also might not 
necessarily very high threshold for a democratic event. Yes, but I don't think that's what Mr. Johnson is speaking to. He's just saying that there is a well-grounded suspicion that the irregularities, which he seems to have found, uh, were tied to the consulate. And what I want to know is, do you accept those conclusions today? Yeah, yeah sorry, if you're not asking me about how, how I, I accept that there is a suspicion that um, PRC officials in Canada uh, were engaged in, um, in some way with that nomination. Uh, I, don't, I can't speak to irregularities. Perhaps, perhaps you know what irregularities specifically Mr. Johnson was talking about? Um, no, not as well as some people in this room. Um, all right. Well, you, you do accept, though, and, and you say that there's a suspicion. Do you accept that it's well-grounded? That was Mr. Johnson's view. I, I, can't, I can't speak to analysis made by others. I certainly, uh, ha and again, distinguishing what I knew in 2019 from what I may have uh, learnt later uh, leaves me in an awkward position around answering this. All right, I'll move to my uh, next document, and that is CAN 15842, please. And you've seen this already, it is the October, late October 2022 briefing. You've already given the document. Scrolling down a little further, there we are, thank you. Um, my question for you is, did the director say words to the effect of, or convey the message that, as you see here, Canada has been slower than our Five Eyes allies to respond to the foreign interference threat? Uh, no. All right. And if you continue on in that same passage, such as proactively publicizing successful disruption activities, was that something that the director conveyed to you? Uh, no. When I spoke, briefing notes prepared for the director didn't particularly align with the actual briefing we got. Yes. Um, the briefing was spent almost entirely on specific cases, and all of the these notes prepared for the, the, the director, uh, generally saying, yes, foreign interference is serious, India, China, serious, would have taken up the first he would have gotten right into the cases. So this is not... Uh, I'm just going to show you one more point from this. I do have your point. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Yes, uh, it's the uh, bullet point are able to conduct foreign interference successfully in Canada because there are no consequences, either legal or political. Foreign interference is therefore a low risk and high reward endeavor. Did the director convey in those words or in some similar words that message that this is uh, an, uh, a low risk, high reward endeavor because there are no consequences? Uh, no. Thank you, that's very helpful. Thank you. Counsel for Jenny Kwan. Minister, good afternoon. Um, so, Prime Minister, it's a matter of public record uh, that MP Kwan has alleged that she uh, may have been the target of foreign interference by the Communist Party of China in the 2021 general election. And so, based on that premise, uh, there's uh, time permitting, there's three sets of. The first is uh, how MP Kwan. Thesis that she was a, a target for foreign interference. Uh, the second is uh, why she might be a target. And, and the third is how uh, foreign interference might be occurring against her in Canada. So, uh, so you're aware, Prime Minister, that uh, MP Kwan received a confidential briefing from CSIS 
uh, on uh, May 26, 2023. Yes. Uh, and you're aware that she's not shared publicly any of the class of information she received uh, in that briefing. I, I believe that to be correct, yes. But, but you're aware she stated that she was told that she is an evergreen target for the Communist Party of China and for the rest of her life even after she leaves politics. I can't speak to directly what she was told, but that seems, yeah. uh, seems consistent with what, uh, what they might have told her, yes. So, so Prime Minister, are, are you able in this setting uh, to um, share with us whether you had any role in the decision to brief MP Kwan about foreign interference? Um, when... Uh, there were, uh, when there are um, allegations or information brought to me regarding a particular member of parliament or a particular individual, often one of our uh, first uh, responses in my office, my response, is to uh, ask uh, CSIS or the security agency involved to engage directly with the individual. Um, the nature of that engagement, do that, sometimes us encouraging it allows uh, But I believe in this case, uh, we encouraged uh, those briefings to happen. And so you, you encourage them to happen. And um, if you're able to comment, uh, was one of the reasons why thing to happen was to enable uh, MP Kwan to herself identify foreign interference that might be occurring and to take steps if she could to counter foreign interference. Um, the challenge of foreign interference exists for, as we've heard, um, for just about every elected official at every different uh, order of government as a potential threat. But we also know that diaspora communities, particularly uh, from uh, certain countries of origin, are more, uh, more susceptible to be targets on that. So um, whether it's uh, defensive briefings or, or threat reduction measures, which are two, uh, two different approaches that CSIS and others can use in terms of briefing. Um, it is, they are designed to both inform, make aware, and hopefully help uh, the individual in avoiding Sir. And so, so, one, so one goal is to help individuals avoid foreign interference if it's occurring, so a self-help remedy, if we could an individual to come forth with concerns or the RCMP or the Commissioner of Canada and, and, and so the and of course for for anyone to come forward a member of Parliament or any Canadian who might be targeted for foreign interference the the, the expectation would be that if they presented such a complaint or a concern that it would be investigated thoroughly um, that it would be given the attention that it merits, yes. Okay. And so, and ask, dig, dig in a bit to why MP Kwan might have been targeted and, and what your thoughts are. So are you aware that MP Kwan has testified here that she's, she believes she's been targeted for foreign interference uh, because of her outspoken criticism over many years of the human rights record of the People's Republic of China. Are you, are you aware of that? Uh, yes. Yeah. And so she's, you know, you're aware of her criticisms of the Tiananmen Square massacre. Yes. And the Hong Kong national security law. Yes, like many, many Canadians of all different origins, but particularly progressive Canadians uh, of Chinese origin, um, there, are, there are some very, very um, strong and outspoken and uh, brave individuals who speak up against the, uh, the government of their country of origin. And, and she made some of those criticisms as a parliamentarian. 
mm -hmm. uh, on the floor of the House of Commons. Yes. So, for example, when she spoke in favor of and voted in favor of the resolution on the Uyghur genocide. And so, and so it's clear then that in, in making these criticisms and that she was exercising her parliamentary And no Canadian... And I'd also say more, she yeah. was uh, fulfilling her responsibilities as a member of parliament to represent uh, her constituents and her community in, uh, in our parliament. Agreed. And, and, and that no Canadian, uh, MP or not, should be subject to foreign interference for expressing their political views. Indeed, yes. So, so, so I, I want to then take you, uh, then, if, if I may, Prime Minister, to how foreign interference by the, by the CCP might be occurring in Canada. And so we've had testimony interference activities occur through the United Front. Communist Party, you're, you're aware of that. Uh, not exclusively. Right, not ex but but including through the the United Front. Yes, there are there are many different ways, uh, and uh, the United Front is one of the ways in which, uh, in which uh, the Communist Party of China exerts either influence or perhaps in other cases. Are you able to comment on the other ways. Are a perfect example of of something. That has been in the news uh, recently that our friend from the block asked about earlier today. Good. And, and of course, and they often, the United Front often operates through proxies, we've learned. Uh, you agree that that's correct? Yes. And, and I think the words you used to describe foreign interference in your examination in chief were covert, uh, coercive, uh, might funnel funds to Chinese proxies in Canada? Um, I, am, I, I, am, I am wary of getting into too much of uh, what I know in an open forum here, but um, I think there's been evidence uh, submitted along the lines of that. Okay, and, 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 and so it has confirmed that the United Front uses proxies to encourage you to go directly to the source uh, of, of these reports and allegations. I can say that, yes, I am kept very, very highly briefed on various ways of interference. I'm not always sure which ones I can talk about that talking about public record things, and it's good that you're putting Of course, part of the some of the rituals of Canadian political life involve attending events hosted by different ethnic communities that are potentially quite significant. So Vasaki would be one I'm sure that you might be familiar with. Yes. And so there is a certain significance then to having been invited for many years to an event and then suddenly disinvited in a public way. That would be designed to send a message. Wouldn't you agree? Um, yeah. I think publicly disinviting someone uh, as um, as as wrong as it would be um, might fall into the category of influence rather than interference. If a, a diplomat is hosting a, a, a an event. Uh, that the Chinese government is behind or through with proxies, um, it's a fairly open and visible way, and perhaps meant to be open and visible to exclude an individual. Uh, that unfortunate, or much as we might disagree with it, it sounds like surreptitious, uh, but more Here, but I, I understand your point that that it is unfortunate that China, uh, in general, tries to uh, silence critics 
of its regime, including uh, you know, high profile uh, members of parliament. Okay, so a, a couple of concluding questions, if I may, Prime Minister. So the, the, the GAC panel testified that if the People's Republic of China, or for that matter, matter any other uh, foreign state, were engaged in foreign interference in Canada, it would violate international law. Um, do you have any reason to disagree? I, I am, yes, the um, foreign interference is, is violation of Canadian law and international law. And, and you'd agree then it's a violation of Canadian sovereignty? Yes. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jarman, representing a Renault tool. Thank you, Prime Minister, or thank you, Commissioner. Prime Minister, my name is Tom Jarman. I represent Aaron O'Toole. Uh, just building on a question that my uh, colleague was asking, uh, Mr. O'Toole, similar to Ms. Kwan, has also received a defensive briefing from CSIS. Um, and was that done uh, with the permission or direction of your office? Um, again, it is not something that uh, CSIS needs to get permission from uh, the Prime Minister's office to do, uh, but in this case, we certainly uh, uh, encouraged it. Yeah. He's come under this sort of... Uh, they should be made aware of that? Uh, that is in, in general. Your office given direction to that effect? Um, threat reduction or defensive briefings it gives or doesn't give, uh, but certainly our posture has been one of uh, encouraging uh, CSIS to keep all parliamentarians uh, informed and, and aware of uh, not just threats against them, but of, of issues of foreign interference. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess if I could go to CAN 4495. And uh, this is a document that's supposed to be sometime in late February of 2023. It was prepared by CSIS. Um, Commission Council has shown it to you, and uh, I believe you also saw it during your witness interview. If you could scroll down to the third page. Uh, a little further, please. Thank you very much. Oops, back up, please. Thank you. Um, so I understand from your witness uh, interview that you were not uh, advised of this, these events concurrent to them happening in the election in 2021. Um, but I would ask, after February 21st of 2023, have you ever been briefed by either CSIS or the NSIA with respect to conclusions similar to this that Observed, there were observed online and media activities aimed at discouraging Canadians, particularly Chinese heritage, from supporting the Conservative Party of Canada leader Aaron O'Toole, and particularly Stevenson Richmond East Kenny Chu. The timing of the efforts uh, to align with Conservative polling improvements, similarities in language with articles published by agreements between these Canada based outlets and PRC entities. I believe I think it's, it's what, 66. Um, not the interview summaries, the uh, the uh, prepared summaries. Protectors. Madam Commissioner, I think the Prime Minister is referring to the multi-source topical summary. That one. On. Oh. Topical summaries, yes. Here, she. Or she. I believe it's number four, if that assists. Um, dot four. We just scroll yes, down. I have that page. one. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you. That's it. So that's a topical summary, but I, going back to my question, which was, has any uh, official, either the NSIA or the director of CSIS or anyone on your staff, briefed you with respect to the conclusions that were in CAN 4495? And just to be fair to the witness, uh, perhaps he could be allowed to look at those conclusions one by one rather than sure. in a mass. Well, possibly we can go back to CAN 4495 then. Yes, I have, I have the summary, so if we can go back on the page to the document you brought Thank up. Thank you. Right. Scroll down. Thank you. Further. Overall statement is observed online in media activities. Yeah, what I will what I would go to is the bottom of that, uh, the last line in the second paragraph there, uh, and refer to the um, general summary there, point six, that says, no PRC state direction of the incident was detected or reported. Yes, I realize that's what that document says. My question is, what, did anyone brief you with respect to those allegations that are in CAN 4495? And um, your answer is no, that's fine. First of all, these are uh, briefing notes that I never saw. These are briefings for a briefer who then uh, gave a briefing that, as we've seen, may or may not have included yes. all of these things. I am and was, however, aware of the elements in the summary uh, that talked about uh, whether it's uh, following the publication of the article in the Hill Times. Uh, there was uh, a number of different um, media organizations that picked up and, and, uh, and ran with those things. Uh, but again, getting to the bottom line that no you know, Chinese state direction of the incident was okay. detected or reported. Thank you. And I'd like to turn now to COM008, which is the, the cabinet directive from 2021 with respect to um, their know, critical action incident public protocol. And this is the standing directive right now. It is unlike 2019, it, this is an ongoing thing. Is that correct? Uh, yes, this is the existing directive. Intervention by the panel of five would either be high used, observed with certainty, uh, and Mr. Oblong used the high threshold as well. Is that consistent with your understanding of how the directive is meant to apply? The directive is meant to apply, uh, and the panel is meant to kick in when there are threats uh, to Canada being able to hold a free and fair election. Um, threshold, uh, because just the act of uh, engaging for the panel uh, could itself have um, an impact on the um, unfolding of the election. So the um, expertise uh, and the um, experience uh, and the professional judgment of the people on the panel is what we lean on significantly for uh, whether and how uh, they intervene. I will highlight that not every intervention by the P5 would be uh, to convene a supper hour press conference to tell Canadians about something in the middle of an election campaign. It could involve as it has, apprising different parties of concerns. It could be involve uh, asking uh, or working with a social media giant to take down a particular piece of misinformation. Like there are different things that we are to do to ensure that the election remains free and fair for Canadians. Can we scroll down uh, in the directive itself? 
please. And into five. There we are, the process. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I have to go back up again. So they say, uh, paragraph three, please. You say, Minister, or Prime Minister, rather, that it's, this can be engaged by threats. The panel of five has testified that it must be an event, be in fair election, at which they would give no. Is it your evidence that the panel can act on? Th I ask actually to scroll down to go to 4.0 or, f no, next one, 5.0. Uh, there we go. Lays out a process through which can threatens Canada's ability to have a free and fair election should notification be necessary. I suppose an incident could be an event, uh, but I think if there is an imminent threat um, to Canada's ability to have free and fair election, I have no doubt that uh, the panel would engage with that, whether or not the incident or event had happened or was just imminently about to happen. And just one last question, please, Commissioner. And that threat Sorry. could crystallize at the general election level, at the riding level, or indeed among a diaspora community level that's spread out over across several ridings. Sorry, and what's your question? That threat could crystallize could, yes. at either the general election level, an individual riding level, or among a, a broader community that's spread out over several ridings. Uh, Yes, as long as it threatens Canada's ability to have a free and fair election, uh, either at the riding level or in the aggregate uh, general election, which is just the sum of 338 individual riding elections. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Tom. Acting on behalf of the Conservative Party. Good evening, Mr. Prime Minister. Could I have, just give me a moment, could I have uh, TRN uh, 6 called up, please? And while that's being called up, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, in preparation for your testimony here today, have you been aware that that he spoke to PRC officials on multiple occasions about the two Michaels while they were held in captivity in China? Um, I believe so, yes. Okay. And am I correct that the two Michaels had been taken into custody and detained uh, in China commencing in December 2018 until they were released at the end of uh, September 2021? Yes. Okay. Would you agree with me that the detention of the two Michaels was a very high profile and very sensitive matter? both in Canada and abroad? It was certainly very high profile, uh, and it was uh, a detention that uh, caused us to mobilize broadly. It was certainly a very difficult experience for the two Michaels and their families, but it was also something that uh, mobilized an awful lot of, uh, of not just Canadians, but our partners around the world. Thank you. We've heard evidence uh, and seen evidence in this inquiry that, that at least one of the general counsel, counsel general in I have a couple of questions for you uh, regarding Happy to hear from him about that. I, I would urge him to refer to the summary, the topical summary on this issue. I'm, I'm going to come to the topical summary, but if I could ask the Prime Minister generally, uh, Mr. Dong had been having conversations with the PRC. I 
can't recall offhand at what point that was. Do you remember what year, sir? Um, perhaps there's documents that refer to the meeting that I can talk about publicly, uh, the various briefings that I've had when, when these allegations came out. I believe, actually, I believe they, this was the source, this was uh, a matter disclosed in the leaks in uh, the fall of 2022, uh, and it was only subsequent to those leaks that I became aware of those conversations. So it would have been uh, late in 2022. You don't believe you were made aware of any such conversations prior to then? No. And uh, could I ask that can some uh, to be called up, please? And I believe uh, Ms. Chowdhury uh, took you through this document to some extent earlier. This is a summary of intelligence held by CSIS uh, and the intelligence agencies relating to Handong and its communications with the People's Republic of China. Uh, relating to the two Michaels, and uh, I take it from your answers earlier, you, received, you reviewed this document in preparation for your testimony. Uh, there's a summary of five points. Can you confirm, and I, th I think you may have, that in preparation for today, uh, you have received I have six points on mine. I, I may have misspoken. You're correct, quite correct. Six points. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Can I turn Perhaps you can review that. And while you are, this, the second sentence says the PRC released the two Michaels at that moment, and opposition parties would view the PRC's Canadian pro approach to the PRC. See that? Yes. When were you first made aware of MP Dong expressing this view? As I said, this was subsequent to leaks. But let me also just say that um, it's aware of information alleging that MP Dong expressed this view. As has been uh, previously stated, there, there have been uh, significant questions around both translation and summary of uh, the actual uh, exchange uh, that, you know, I, I don't think I need to read the, the first page filled with caveats around incomplete, single sourced, uh, varying degrees of reliability, you know, not necessarily uh, indicating corroboration uh, or reliability of sources. So there's a lot of uncertainty around even the things that we're saying in the summary, that we're seeing in the summaries. Can I ask you, Prime Minister, have you personally reviewed that summary? This summary? No, the, the summary. Um, Madam Commissioner, I'm concerned that we're I'm not yeah. sure. I, I can say yes to that, though. Yes, okay. I have personally done that. Um, but there's not much more I can say about it. That's fine. Thank you. Can we call up uh, COM uh, 118, which is the Special Rapporte Rapporteur's first, first report that was uh, produced or dated May 23, 2023? COM 118? Yes. Just a minute. And if we, I'd like to go to page 26, small Roman numeral eight. There's an analysis of a, of a piece of reporting uh, that Handong advised the PRC consulate to extend the detention of the two Michaels, Global News, March 22, 2023. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, and immediately below that, uh, 
Mr. Johnston comments on how there, there has been considerable media, media attention about an alleged transcript of this conversation. You see that? Yes. And he then says, I have reviewed the same intelligence report that was provided to the Prime Minister relating to this allegation, which I am advised is the only intelligence that speaks to this issue. I can report the following, and we're going to come to the following. My, my question now, though, is, Mr. Johnson tells us that he reviewed the same intelligence report that you did, and that this is the only report that exists that speaks to this issue. So my question for you is the following. Is the intelligence report that Mr. Johnson is referring to that we just looked at, or is it something else? I'm not sure the witness can answer that in this setting. And are, are there, other, for now we'll go with written reports, uh, either hard copy or electronic, that you're aware of that perhaps n were not shared with Mr. Johnson that might relate to precisely what was or wasn't said uh, the PRC official? I'm not certain I can answer that question. For the same reasons? Uh, For reasons of, of security and, and confidentiality. Thank you. National security. Thank you. Have those reports, uh, if there are any such reports, have they been provided to the present commission? I, I again, I'm, I'm not sure I can, I, I cannot confirm or infirm um, the existence of, of any other reports that I cannot speak to here. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Johnson then gives his assessment of that particular allegation uh, as follows. He says, the allegation is false. Mr. Dong discussed the two Michaels with a PRC official, but then their detention. The allegation that he did make that suggestion has had a very adverse effect. Do you agree with that assessment, sir? Um, yes, we know that the media reports um, and the allegations made in a rather a spectacular fashion about Mr. Dong uh, were false. Okay, uh, but would you in agree with to what he said or didn't say about uh, about the two Michaels? Okay, would you agree with me, sir, that all that Mr. Johnson was commenting on was was what is contained in that heading, that particular allegation? Mr. Johnson didn't comment one way or the other about whether. Uh, what else Mr. Dong might have said to the PRC Council, read the two in Can Samo 2, the, the, I'm not sure the witness can comment on what Mr. Johnson was or was not commenting on. Mr. Prime Minister, I have very many more questions, as you might imagine, but I simply don't have the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. De Luca. Council for Andang. Thank you, Commissioner. Prime Minister, I'm Mark Polly, and as you heard, I represent Handong. I'm going to start with uh, the same issue that Mr. DeLuca finished with, and that is the allegations that were made in the newspaper, in uh, Global at least, uh, relating to the two Michaels. And we, as you know, we heard yesterday from Mr. Klo, among others. And Mr. Klo told us about how after the leaks came out, there were discussions about what to do, what to, how to respond, whether there could be any response. And uh, in particular, he said, there were a number of discussions about how to get the truth out that the story was wrong. And uh, he explained that up until yesterday, he was not able to say that publicly. Are you able to, to um, first of all, tell us, did you have conversations like that as well about whether there was anything the government could do, whether you, anything you could do? Well, further, what we actually, the rapporteur, 
uh, who had the opportunity to uh, quite categorically that the allegation the special rapporteur uh, those uh, allegations as false was perhaps uh, more reassuring to confer concerned Canadians than uh, having um, official party as Mr. Tong uh, categorizing category. Does that, uh, well, and aside from Mr. Klo have discussions about whether there was anything that could be released before that, like immediately to respond? Um, there, were, there were many discussions uh, following the leaks on this issue, but on uh, a number of the issues that were uh, leaking as uh, we highlighted and attempted to highlight a few times in the media, there were uh, clear falsehoods uh, and inaccuracies in the media reporting. But uh, the challenge of protecting uh, national security meant that we were very much limited in our ability to um, contradict um, the, um, the uh, false allegations being made by uh, the leaker. Uh, and that, <clears throat> that difficulty you're describing, although we've heard as I say, Mr. Klo talk about finally being able to say something publicly yesterday. But I take it that same tension continues. That you're able to say. But you know, given as as uh, Mr. Klo pointed out yesterday, we are now in a position to um, to express uh, and to repeat that the way it was characterized in the um, in the media. So let me, the ongoing discussion about buses. Uh, we heard about you being briefed by Mr. Broadhurst in September of 2019. And you talked about him flagging concerns and describing this scenario of students uh, being brought to Don Valley North nomination meeting. And uh, you, you asked whether the intelligence agency understood this thing that busing people to nomination meetings is uh, standard, or I think you said regular earlier. Is that right? Yes. And... It will be your last question. Thank you. Uh, and you... Sorry, let me make sure. And you raised the issue of whether the intelligence agency understood uh, this, this basic issue that someone like you who knows politics and nomination campaigns knows. And did you figure out an answer to that, whether the people at the agency who were reporting this had that context? Oh, certainly. Listen, our, our intelligence agencies, even though they don't organize uh, nomination meetings themselves as you know, political parties do, uh, you know, regularly turn to experts and uh, you know learn about the things that they uh, don't know about when they need to. Uh, so I am very confident that our intelligence agencies uh, now know a lot more about the unfolding of nominations, uh, which is important because they need to be able to ensure that those nominations, uh, like all electoral events, um, you know, by the residents and indeed by uh, are free and fair and uh, absent interference uh, by uh, foreign actors. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Human Rights Coalition. Okay. Uh, my name is Sarah Teach, and as the commissioner stated, I'm representing the Human Rights Coalition. Uh, I understand, Mr. Prime Minister, that you have a lot of confidence in your NSIA's ability to receive information from the national security agencies. 
but I want to ask about your level of confidence in the agency's abilities to receive information from those most vulnerable, namely uh, members of targeted diaspora communities. So let me just start with this. Uh, were you aware, Mr. Prime Minister, that the RCMP's National Security Information Network is only available in English and French? I was not. Were you aware that the uh, CSE's online reporting tool, as well as CSIS's reporting tool, and the OCCE's complaints form on the website are also available in only English and French? But I am also aware that all those agencies use uh, in language um, individuals uh, who are able to uh, read. I take your word for it that uh, the online forms are only in English and French. I appreciate that. And we also heard on uh, March 27th with the diaspora panel, that was the first day of these hearings, that community members oftentimes don't feel uh, empowered to reach out to the agencies. They feel that they won't be heard. They feel it's a waste of time for whatever reason. How can you expect the agencies themselves to really know? And therefore, how can you expect the NSAA to of diaspora community members is happening, including in the context of elections? This is certainly a challenge, and it is something that we've been working on over the past years to try and uh, improve and increase the not just the diversity within our various agencies, uh, but also uh, the ability of who are often most vulnerable to interference, uh, particularly in diaspora communities, but also at the same time, um, often with good reason, most suspicious of uh, authorities and uh, enforcement agencies that, uh, uh, that have not always treated them fairly in the past. Thank you. Um, given these limitations, does this plant even a seed of doubt in your mind in terms of the integrity of the 2019 and 2021 general elections? Um, I think those are two different things. Uh, the challenge of um, challenge of any democracy is ensuring that, that people who perhaps disagree with the outcome of a given election still have faith that that is indeed the will of the people, the will of citizens, uh, and that's where having uh, a panel in place both in 2019 and 2021 uh, 20, that could uh, say that uh, election was free and fair is uh, a really important expand it and become more um, perhaps more <clears throat> sensitive uh, or alert to um, various vulnerabilities that um, are more difficult to go into, particularly. So um, there is more to do, but I do have confidence in the ability of our uh, intelligence agencies and our panel. Um, to have drawn the conclusion that the uh, elections in 2019 and in 2021 were indeed free and fair. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dudi for the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. Or, uh, yes, no, it's the Sikh coalition, I'm sorry. You'll be next. Thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> Mr. Trudeau, my name is Prabhjot Singh. I'm appearing on behalf of the Sikh Coalition. Um, so I don't have a whole lot of time, but I want to start by asking uh, whether you would agree that your government missed key opportunities to hold India to account for its interference in Canada. And, and to be more specific, um, so we can narrow down a concise answer, that there were attempts made by the government to minimize the Assessment? No. Five five. 
by your government um, in the hopes of creating some oversight and transparency on security and intelligence issues. Uh, Mr. Operator, if we can go to page 73 of the PDF. So as you know, this report uh, deals with uh, concerns about foreign interference. Is that 73 of the PDF? Or yeah, 55 of the actual document. And so this is a, a section that deals with foreign interference specifically. And if we can continue to scroll down until 79, please. You can go a little bit faster. And so I'll write there if you can hold for a second, if you scroll up, please. So there is mention specifically of, of foreign interference by the People's Republic of China and continue scrolling. There's mention of the Russian Federation and if we can pause right there, and it specifically says other states engaged in foreign interference. And if you continue scrolling, that entire section has been redacted. Mm -hmm. Mr. Operator, if we can go to page 108 of the PDF. And if you continue scrolling until 113, you see it, it, these are instances of Canada's response to foreign interference in the relation to China. Of uh, a response to Russian interference. And if we scroll down, uh, is redacted. So Mr. Trudeau, I'm going of this report outline details of Indian electoral interference, as well as outlining governmental fail. So, and so I, I, so I understand that you may not be able to uh, address this in a public setting for national security reasons. And if that's the case, you can indicate that to, to the commissioner. Uh, so can you confirm that that is the substance that's been redacted in this report? Um. Obviously, in a public setting, I can't speak to redactions made for national security, but I, I will say that the principle anywhere in the world uh, has all the rights of a Canadian uh, to be free from uh, extortion, coercion, um, interference uh, from a country that they left behind. Uh, and how we have stood up for Canadians, including uh, in the very serious uh, case that I brought forward to Parliament of the killing of, uh, of Nijar, um, demonstrates our government's commitment to uh, defending the rights and freedoms of Canadians for whom, uh, if, which are the reasons for which so many people uh, crossed oceans and continents uh, to come live in this country and build this country. And the suggestion that we can to defend Canadian rules and values and defend Canadians from foreign interference is uh, simply... But I do want to confirm that it was you that approved the redactions in this report. Is that correct? Redact based, on, based on suggestions... Uh, from public servants that you received? Redactions are made uh, by professional public servants uh, and uh, we sign off on them, but we do not modify them. Uh, you do have the possibility to push back against excessive made by professional public servants, not by the political wing. And, and does the Prime Minister have the authority to push back on the suggestions that are made in cases where there may be excessive redactions? That gets into the entire question of uh, declassification of information and in the American system, uh, the uh, in ways that uh, are not replicated in our system here in Canada. So just very simply, I have one last question I want to ask after this. Does the Prime Minister have the authority and the ability to push back against those suggestions when there's excessive redaction? The Prime Minister uh, has an uh, ability to engage in discussions uh, and uh, ask for reasons. But like I said, as, uh, as Prime Minister and as uh, a government, our uh, habit and our 
uh, approach has always been uh, to allow the professional public service to make determinations around what needs to be redacted in the name of national security and confidentiality. Uh, Madam Commissioner, I have one final question, if that's okay. Uh, very quick. Sure. I, I think you would agree that the lack of meaningful steps to expose and stop foreign interference activities when they first arise, uh, including deliberate actions to redact any failures that may have been included in the NSI COP report, uh, could play a role in India's increasingly aggressive interference and repressive, uh, repression activities over this period. Uh, effectively and failing to bring the threat of Indian foreign interference uh, to the Canadians' attention earlier. Is that correct? I think that's certainly a question one needs to ask of the previous Conservative government that was known for its very cosy relationship with the uh, current Indian government, uh, whereas our government has always stood up to defend minorities in Canada and the rights uh, of minorities to speak out, even if it uh, irritates uh, their home countries overseas. Thank you. Those are all my questions. So, Mr. Dudi, it's your turn. Good evening, Prime Minister. Uh, it's John Dudi. I'm counsel for the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. Uh, we've heard uh, that Russia's foreign interference activities in foreign elections was the catalyst for the plan to protect Canada's democracy, and that Russia was a foreign nation that the Canadian government was concerned could potentially interfere in Canadian elections, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, we've also heard from the site task force and the panel of five that neither identified any foreign interference activity by Russia in either the 2019 or the 21 general election. It would seem possible that Russia was not interested in interfering with Canadian elections in those years, or equally possible that they did and the Canadian government failed to detect it. Would you agree that it's possible that Russia interfered in one or both the elections and the Canadian government simply failed to notice it? I would highlight that, of course, um, it is always possible that the entire body of our national security intelligence agencies are um, very sophisticated cyber uh, uh, and security uh, communications established absolutely nothing um, or that um, be very wary about saying that, oh, you know, despite the fact you didn't find any evidence of it, it still might have happened. I think we have seen the extent to which Russia is engaged in misinformation, disinformation, and actions of, of, uh, of sowing chaos and destabilizing democracy democracies around the world, including uh, attempts at cyber uh, attacks and, and successful cyber attacks in Canada. Um, but I think one of the big differences between Russia and a number of other hostile or challenging state of um, a a critical mass of either uh, Russian diaspora or um, Russian speakers in Canada, as you contrast with the situation in Ukraine or in Latvia or elsewhere, where uh, there is a, a, an easier threshold for them to interfere in uh, democratic processes. You spoke about the need for Canadians to be confident that the government is doing what it can to keep Canadians safe. How confident that Russia did not interfere with either election? Um, we know Russia is responsible for significant amounts of propaganda, of misinformation, of disinformation, and uh, certainly attempts at interference are uh, no doubt uh, ongoing from Russia. They are a hostile actor, hostile to Canada, hostile to our values, hostile to our support of Ukraine, uh, and hostile to our democracy. 
But to say, to read the belief that Russia posed a integrity of our elections to the outcome of determined. And finally, would you expect members of the Canadian Ukrainian community to have a high level of confidence in that conclusion as well? Um, yes, I think the Canadian Ukrainian community of confidence in the conclusions by all of our national security experts and top public servants that the elections in 2019 and 2021 are free and fair. At the same time, I think Ukrainian Canadians, like all Canadians, need to remain vigilant to Russian disinformation and to the amplification of pro-Russian narratives in contexts and coming from places that one wouldn't suspect uh, pro-Russian narratives to be amplified. I'm very pleased to see that Ukraine just passed the updated uh, over the past days, uh, and I am continue to be bewildered at the fact that the Conservative Party uh, voted against uh, that update because they fell prey to uh, pro-Russian narratives that are uh, undermining Canada's support for Ukraine amongst Conservative Canadians, which I know is uh, a thing of deep distress for many Ukrainian Canadians, and rightly so. Thank you, Prime Minister. Merci, Roy, for the RCDA. Russian-Canadian Democratic Alliance. Hello, Mr. Prime Minister. Hello, Madam Commissioner. I am representing the Russian-Canadian Alliance. We have heard that some disinformation campaigns could have affected some political parties in the 2021 elections. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I want to remove politics about this, and I want to talk about disinformation. Mr. Indicate that the conclusion from our national security of ensuring the integrity of our elections, well, they agreed that there was no impact in the results due to foreign interference, whether it's in the different counties or in the general elections at large. So yes, there were attempts to interfere, but our elections were, uh, the integrity of our elections stood firm. Question, I want to ask if that kind of attempt affected just one party or could it affect all? parties, leaders of all parties, like the Liberal uh, Party and the others, answer. Well, appearance can affect just one party, all, all parties, or a few parties. In the, It can also affect the country of origin, the county, and the region as well. Question, did you witness this as some leader? of the Liberal parties during the 2021 and 2019 elections? Answer. In my capacity as a party leader, I was supposed to campaign, speak to as many Canadians as possible, and ensure that as many Liberal uh, members are elected as possible. to ensure that the integrity of the elections stood firm. And they concluded that in both elections, 2021 and 2019, these elections were free and fair. With your own ears and saw with your own eyes, did. Campaigns answer. Well, disinformation quite widespread, more in 2021 than in 2019. We saw conspiracy theories with respect to vaccination. We also witnessed conspiracy theories about the World Economic Forum. 
and even personal attacks against me and my family. So yes, there was misinformation and disinformation during those campaigns. Question. Uh, well, it, it can't be easy, especially when it affects your family. But my question is, you understand how social media works. So you did your campaign in 2015 thanks to social media. I'm sure it was very helpful in that campaign. I want to know whether there were some disinformation campaigns that were more important, and do you think that it impacted voters during those two campaigns? Answer. Well, every political party was using social media uh, to try and garner votes. So, of course, social media played an important role in those uh, elections. Question. I was talking about disinformation campaigns, wondering if you know whether we can influence voters in that regard. Answer. I think we can see that disinformation and misinformation impacts uh, several people. There are thousands of Canadians who believed that vaccination was more dangerous than, than uh, COVID-19 itself. And that is an example of people who were affected, sometimes uh, fatally, by uh, disinformation. Uh, Mr. Tira, you have a last question? Um, this is my last question. I want to know if you witnessed disinformation that could, if you had witnessed this, why didn't you raise this issue with uh, government institutions, those who are mandated and authorized to act on these misinformation and disinformation campaigns, especially when it affects the integrity of elections? Answer, because those institutions, and I speak regularly about this with my national security advisors about the impact of misinformation and disinformation. We can see, let's remember the situation that happened with the convoys in Ottawa to understand that it's a real situation, but it's not up to me to tell the panels that you have to be wary of disinformation and misinformation. It's part of their job to ensure that the elections are remain uh, keep their integrity. And they did a good job in 2019 and 2021. And we understand that in 2025, it will be even more difficult, and they have to keep doing the excellent job. One last question, if I may. If you, as the party leader, you're in an election campaign and you see um, serious interference, um, false information, would you report that? Is Elections Canada doing its work? I trust that they will do their work but it is part of our responsibility, all of us, whether we're citizens, candidates, party leaders, or political parties. We all need to work with the site task force to uh, report any misinformation or disinformation. And this is part of what we're going to do with the panel. Uh, we will raise issues with the panel, but the panel does not depend on us to do its work. But yes, absolutely, we can contribute and we should. Thank you. Uh, the uh, uh, Attorney General. Reexamination. No, thank you, Commissioner. Merci beaucoup. Alors, je ne sais pas si je dois dire que vous êtes. Thank you very much. I don't know if I can say you are free to leave, but I will allow myself to tell you that you are free to leave. Thank you very much. Order, please. Alors, s'il vous plaît, the sitting of the Foreign Interference Commission has adjourned. Cette séance de la Commission sur l'ingérence étrangère est levée.